Hey everybody, welcome to the Life After. This is Brady Harden, and with me is my normal co-host uh, Chuck Parson. Hey Chuck Parson, and we have a special co-host with me, Corey Pig. How's it going, Corey from Pig from Failed, Failed Missionary. Missionary? Yeah, we have a special, special, special guest today. Um, so I first heard about Mr. Rick Allen Ross from a video game that I was playing. Uh, uh-huh. Legitimately, what it is a video game, uh, Far Cry Five, and it was about big release. Killing off Christian fundamentalist cults, <laughs> and I was like, "Hey, this looks like exposure therapy this to is- me." <laughs> I'm, just kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Do not murder. All right, that's one thing I can agree on. That's with one my thing past. we kept from the Bible. That's yeah. the one. Th- no, I'm just kidding. But um, you know, it, it was cool because as you sneak around, you can listen to these people talk and they interact and they say things that cult members would say, and it really stuck out to me of like how some of the the processing, how inter- interacting, just the chat, the the, the the casual conversation. So I found out they, I read an article, they hired uh, somebody to come in and like be a cult expert. And then I started to realize, Oh my God, he's in like a whole bunch of documentaries that I've watched that I see online. And then I was like, I need to find him. We need to get him on the show. And today we have the one and only Rick Allen Ross, Rick Allen Ross. Yeah. Welcome to the show. Uh, So for those of you who aren't familiar, Rick has been, uh, he's done a lot of TV, uh, for, for various reasons. He was, uh, like, like Brady was saying, he was a consultant for Far Cry 5. He's been a consultant for CBS, NBC. Um, he's been featured on the Today Show, on CNN World News, on, uh, Oprah, on Dr. Phil. Uh, there was a CBS 48 hour special, uh, on his, uh, on his work in the, back in the nineties. How long was it? 48 hours. <laughs> so long. Yeah, there was so much, so much footage. <laughs> Um, yeah. Part of it is just him eating breakfast. It's uh, like the Truman Show, <laughs> right? Uh, and uh, they call him they call him the deprogrammer. I would <laughs> he watch is a, it. He is a a cult deprogrammer. That's uh, I think primarily what he does is uh, is meet with people uh, that whose family members or friends or something have uh, have called him to come in and, and sort of help a person that they know and love that has been uh, sucked into a cult and is trapped uh, and is mentally has been brainwashed uh, in one way or, or the other and uh, and they call him in to, to sort of like have an intervention and uh, and help deprogram people so uh, Rick also does tons and tons of research on cults like we literally just threw out the word YWAM and he he talked about it for a couple of minutes like we like he knows all of the he knows all of the major cults uh pretty well he knows the the families associated with him and the names and the and and uh and he's written an, an extensive book on on cults uh, how they work what they are uh on uh like sort of analyzing different cults called cults inside out uh so we are you know, he also runs a nonprofit called Cult Education Institute uh with a website with a lot of resources on it so uh we are very excited this guy is an expert in the truest sense longest introduction ever <laughs> it is it it's is Rick Ross. I know I did, I feel like I I <laughs> miss some stuff still <laughs> and also worth noting today we have Corey Pig in the studio which we mentioned but Corey was featured on a on an episode uh in season 1 and he has his own podcast called failed missionary that's been doing really well and uh he wanted to join us for this interview so he drove all the way up from nashville uh to be in the room with us so that's super cool we're excited about that rick did we miss anything uh really cool from from our introduction about you what what would you (laughs) well i i think the the people throw around the word expert a lot and Uh uh anybody can say they're an expert and what i would uh, include is that i've been qualified accepted and testified as a court expert in 11 states include mm. and washington dc including united states federal court after a daubert hearing uh, which is when the court puts you on trial to determine whether or not you really are an expert so i've done as you say a lot of documentaries uh worked on far cry 5 with dan hay the creative director of far cry 5 it was really fun collaborating with him cool. And uh, I've been doing my work since 1982, and I launched the database, the Cult Education Institute, in 1996. And it's like a behemoth that just keeps growing and growing, like the great blob uh, of information. Very cool. Uh, Also, yeah, I forgot to mention high-profile thing. Uh, Rick was... Uh, involved as a consultant with ATF and FBI during the Waco siege in 1993, uh, which was a, a super big, big deal. The Branch Davidians and the uh, 
uh, you know, I, I obviously like kind of a controversial event. People wonder if the FBI handled it well or whatever. But anyway, uh, Rick was Rick was uh, involved in that and tried to help defuse the situation uh, as much as he could. So hmm. um, anyway, Rick, so we're going to jump in. Um, I'm going to start with the the boring questions that you have to answer all the time, just because I, I really think that these uh, these basic principles of, of cults that you've laid out are really important for our listeners to hear. And then I want to get into mm. some more interesting questions. <laughs> so, uh, so uh, let's see. Elements of a cult. What, what, how do you define a cult? What goes into uh, a, what you would call a dangerous cult? Well, there are three core characteristics. And I'm basing this on a paper written by Robert J. Lifton, a psychiatrist who taught at Harvard Medical School. Mm-hmm. And he published this paper called Cult Formation. So there are like three primary characteristics or core criteria. One, there's an absolute totalitarian leader that becomes an object of worship. And whatever that leader says is right is right. Whatever the leader says is wrong is wrong. And a leader has really no accountability, hmm. is is just a dictator. And then number two, that dictator uses coercive persuasion, thought reform and influence techniques, what we call like brainwashing, to uh, gain undue influence over the people in the group. And then finally, that dictator leader uses that undue influence to exploit and do harm to the people that he or she leads. And that that varies by degree from group to group. So there are some groups that are much less destructive than others, some that are really out there, like you mentioned the Waco Davidians, where they had a weapon stockpile and and David Korsh was maxing out his followers' credit cards to buy bullets, and I'm not kidding. Wow, yeah. God, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. You know, that kind of thing is very extreme where you've got a compound and and you know, total isolation. But there are many groups where people live in the community and they they go shopping at the supermarket and it's much more um, it's not as extreme, uh, Mm -hmm. but it still may be destructive. But you look for those three core characteristics, the absolute leader, object of worship, undue influence gained through coercive persuasion, and then using that undue influence to exploit, take advantage of people, money, sexual favors, free labor, whatever. And you've got a destructive cult. Very cool. Thank you. Uh, So uh, did you just say very cool, Chuck? (laughs) Yeah, yeah, cults are cool, man. (laughs) People love it. There's a bunch of documentaries about them. And yeah, Rick, uh, this is the guy that I've been telling you about. We need to, you know, <laughs> deprogram. No, he yeah, right. needs a little deprogram. I'm in, yeah, I'm in it. This I'm is in an it. intervention. Um, yeah, but boy, oh boy. Wouldn't that, <laughs> wouldn't that make for an episode? Um, so, okay, so uh, the, the first element is a strong authoritarian leader. What, what do strong authoritarian mm-hmm. cult leaders look like? Uh, what what kind of psychological profile do they have? What do they act like? Do you want to describe mine? Well, I mean, yeah, um, yeah, uh, please do. Actually, the, the psychologist Margaret Singer and I were once talking about David Koresh, the leader of the yeah, Waco he was Defeat. like a real sicko. Like, well, was, you know, I said, Margaret, is he a psychopath? And she said, Rick, they're all psychopaths. Yeah, okay. Mm. So basically, we're not talking about poster boys and girls for mental health. You know, we're talking about really sinister. Uh, sociopathic uh, individuals Mm. who really they don't have a conscience Uh, whatever is good for them is good whatever is uh, bad for them is bad it's all relative it's all transactional they don't really care about the Mm. people I mean you look at Charlie Manson and you know when he was alive and this was not a well of compassion Mm -hmm. and Manson really didn't give a hoot about anybody but himself Mm-hmm. And that's my experience with cult leaders. They just kind of roll along and people get hurt and people are are really traumatized. And their attitude is, uh, it's all about me. Mm-hmm. And the only sympathy they have is for themselves. And they totally just uh, have virtually no empathy whatsoever mm-hmm. in my experience. Cool. Very good. Cool, Corey, how would you describe your the leaders in your <laughs> community? Oh, uh, yeah. We had one guy, he was a world renowned, is a world renowned photographer still. He's very charismatic. Um, he had this bent to him that he was very smart with marketing and Google SEO. And so in a matter of years, we grew a base from 30 people maybe to 500 or about. 
And then as and in his ways, he kind of undermined a lot of the YWAM bases in Europe. So they were closing and only feeding our base because we were the cool arts missionary base. And as all cults do at some point, they just go through the self-destruction phase and kind mm-hmm. of go their own ways. And so today, I think uh, from what I know, I don't have contact with them, but I think they're back down to about 30 people. And even the core base has split into two divides that won't talk to each other. Okay. Uh, that's really yeah. bizarre, but well, they- I, I, I'll just say I've had many complaints about YWAM. There's mm-hmm. a subsection about YWAM within the Cult Education Institute. I wrote a research paper about YWAM back in the '90s. I did an intervention to get oh, a woman out back. Of wow! YWAM. And so, like, I've I've been to the YWAM world, and mm-hmm. what Corey says is just dead on. And it's like those DTSs. I mean, it just depends on who the charismatic leader is. And it's like a franchise. And uh, the Cunninghams, uh, who run YWAM, uh, with little, if any, meaningful financial transparency or accountability, they don't seem to really care what happens at the DTSs as long as the cash flow keeps keeps on coming. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, so the DTSs can be very abusive. People get embedded in those DTSs. It's like a bubble world, an echo chamber, and the leader dominates. And it can become very cult-like. And I I just want to make one distinction that for me, um, being a fundamentalist Christian or a fundamentalist Jew or a Muslim or a Buddhist or a Hindu or whatever is not the same necessarily as being in a cult. Uh, Mm -hmm. Being in a cult is this leader is saying, look, I'm it. You Mm -hmm. worship me, you obey me. And our group is the only group that has salvation and the answers on the face of the earth. I don't, I don't care about those other churches. They say they're born again and whatever, if it's a Christian group uh, led by somebody like Koresh. Uh, they, they are going to say that salvation is of our group with our leader and mm. only our leader. We have no uh, uh, feeling of, of fellowship with any other church or denomination. We stand alone. And that's how Jim Jones was. That's how David Koresh was. That's how a lot of these guys are. Mm-hmm. Rick, would you say it's a really helpful distinction, oh. I think, for a lot of our listeners, just because I think some of the Calvinism, like churches that I got involved with started to kind of like get approach that and started to kind of like brush up against that. And I think that we had some of the same qualities as that and some of the same struggles that we went through, but maybe necessarily would not be appropriate to call it a cult. Uh, but the cool thing is I could still learn about these, you know, learn about this and apply the same things to uh, fixing my situation. Totally. What were you going to say, Corey? I was going to say, Rick, do you think sometimes that, that it happens on a much more subconscious level, though? Like where it's because it's I feel like with modern cults, at least it's not so black and white. It's like a slippery slope that you get into. So a lot of yeah, these, a, yeah. a lot of, yeah. I'm just saying like, would you say a lot of these or some of these leaders, they may not be outward presenting as this, but it may get there. They can, you know, once you're a few steps into the door. Hmm. Absolutely. When I first knew about David Koresh, he wasn't David Koresh. He was Vernon Howell. Hmm. And hmm. I used to tell people when Jesus comes again, his name will not be Vern, you know, and, uh, and like, yeah. it's not the Messiah that he claims to be. But but he kind of grew worse as time went on. And I've seen this with other cult leaders, Uh, for example, Keith Ranieri, uh, who's now standing trial in New York uh, for racketeering charges and uh, uh, allegations that he facilitated the torture of women. They were physically branded. Uh, mm. With his initials burned into their uh, body. I remember that. Yes. Okay. And and, and so th- I I I met Ranieri, you know, and I dealt with him for years. And I don't think in the beginning he was uh, as controversial, and there were allegations as serious as there were later. Mm. So a lot of these people that are called cult leaders, they they evolve and change. Of uh, some of them get better, most of them get worse. I think absolute power corrupts absolutely. And when you're in a bubble and you're a cult leader and everybody's telling you how great you are 24 seven, you start to get kind of uh, intoxicated with that. And I think David Koresh did. I think a lot of cult leaders do. Rick, so in your book, you your book lays out a lot of different uh, sort of elements of cults and um, what goes into them and, and, and really defines, uh, you actually have a, a chapter on assessment. Is that right? 
Um, yes. So uh, a lot of our listeners have come from fundamentalism or have come from evangelicalism, and uh, they left churches that were uh, very tight communities, very involved uh, in, very personally involved in their lives. Um, and it's, sometimes it's hard to tell if they were controlling or damaging. Sometimes it's hard to tell. Um, you know, I, I guess what I'm getting at is that a lot of our listeners, I think, wonder whether or not they were involved in a cult. Um, because, you know, we're talking about small churches in rural America that nobody's ever heard of. So they don't have any reference. It's not going to be on the news. But there might have been some elements that go into a cult um, involved. And I guess I think it would be helpful for some of our listeners to be able to answer that question. So I'm wondering, what would you say to people that are wondering whether they were, were or are involved in a cult? What questions should they be asking? Um, they should be asking questions like, did your church have a democratically elected board mm -hmm. uh, that people cast ballots like in, a, in an election and they were secret ballots and you elected a board for fixed terms, like maybe you had five board members and they were serving in staggered terms. Uh, was there financial transparency in your church? Did they hand out a budget and tell you, hey, the pastor makes X? Uh, this is his compensation. Uh, this is the budget for our, our school, our church, etc. And and they were transparent. And uh, was the pastor actually employed by the board under the direction of the board and accountable to the board? Could they fire him? Mm -hmm. Or mm -hmm. was your group something entirely different where it was personality driven? The pastor could not be fired. He could kind of handpick who was on the board or kick them out the door. If you asked about the money, they would say, oh, yeah, anybody can know where the money goes. But they really didn't show you anything. Mm -hmm. Certainly not an independently audited financial statement that was signed off by an accounting firm, something like that. So if you are in this small church that's personality driven with a kind of king, ruler, pastor, who could not be checked by a board or, or had no meaningful accountability, hmm. you might have been in kind of a cult. And then another question is, when could, w was the pastor ever wrong? Uh, mm -hmm. would, did anyone criticize the pastor, or was he always right? And another question would be, uh, if you, when you were in the church, did you feel that there were other places that you could go and be spiritually fed? Did the pastor acknowledge that? Did he say, hey, we're just a church of godly people that love Jesus and we love the Lord, but there are many other places that are just as good where you can be spiritually fed. Mm -hmm. Or did the preacher that mm -hmm. ran your church denigrate and run down every other church and give you this feeling like, I can't leave this church because if I leave this church, where am I going to go? There's nowhere right. else that is equal. It, it's the the other churches are lukewarm, and the Bible says, you know, be hot, be cold. If you're lukewarm, I'll spew you out. Right. Mm. So, so that you you have to kind of ask yourself these questions and and say, what kind of a church was I really in? Was it accountable? Was it part of a denominational structure with a, an umbrella organization and an accountability like? Southern Baptist Convention or Church of the Nazarene or Evangelical Free Church? Or was I in a standalone independent church that was ruled over by like a king? Mm -hmm. and, and you had to do whatever that person said. That's interesting. Gotcha. That's yeah. That's really when you helpful. were mentioning the part about kind of cutting off from other churches about creating distrust um, in other denominations and stuff that really hit hard with me as a Calvinist, because, you know, being here in the middle of, America, we don't have a, a boatload of Calvinistic churches or whatever. And so the, the few in this area have kind of created a little, uh, their own bubble, I guess, uh, that they've kind of used to protect each other. And uh, I, I know like out of the three churches I'm thinking of, they've all have had like really big spiritual abuse issues that I know of. Um, but it's kind of weird because they've kind of created that within themselves of saying, you can't go to any other Southern Baptist church. that's not Calvinistic. You have to trust like the, even these very small specific brand of whatever. And that was kind of the stuff that I got, sucked into um that i had to kind of pull myself out of and realize that it was pretty 
pretty harmful and detrimental. So it, it seems like people are evolving of how these things are coming to be, you know, even though it is inside of like the Southern Baptist, there's kind of like even like a subsect inside of there that I think can, can create some issues as well. Mm -hmm. Well, the Southern Baptists, though, they have a convention, they have elected boards, they have delegates that go to a convention, they have a government that is democratic, they have financial transparency. Now, they have issues, like okay. right now they're struggling with the clergy abuse issue mm -hmm. regarding reporting and, and dealing with uh, clergy that sexually abuse people in the church. And, and they're, they're, they, they're kind of dealing with that. But compared to the Roman Catholic Church, I have to say, they seem not as bad. <laughs> <laughs> not as bad. That is, that is like uh, not really a great compliment, right, being that the right. Roman Catholic Church is, is just involved in the, the most horrible scandal after scandal after scandal. But it's an ecclesiastical authority, and, and it's top down. You know, I mean, uh, the, there's the Pope who's elected by the Cardinals, you know, the College of the Cardinals, and then everybody else is picked. And the people that is the laity, the people in the pews, they really don't have that much to say. Mm -hmm. And so I think in the Southern Baptist Convention, even though they have their issues, at least they have democratic governance. Mm -hmm. There's a, okay, I understand that. That makes sense. I see that distinction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can I ask a question off of that? Yeah, go for it. Absolutely. Okay. I just want to wonder what your thought is about, like, obviously the, some cults have leaders, right? But we're talking about structures now. And when, what do you think, what do you have to say to like an object of sorts becoming a leader, like a Bible or like this Holy Spirit? So, because oftentimes these are substitutes for the actual leader, but they're, for, they're, they're foreshadowed onto something else. Uh, like I, he came from the Calvin background. I came from the charismatic background. So the charismatic world, it was always Holy Spirit. And Holy Spirit held that source of control in tandem with the Bible. Oftentimes, the two of those intertwined were really the pastor. If you look deep at, you know what I mean? Is well, I, 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 in my experience, uh, leaders who are very authoritarian basically make you feel that if you disagree with me, you disagree with the word of God. Mm -hmm. If you disagree with me, you disagree with God. You're in opposition to God. Uh, and they'll say, say things like, the Lord told me to tell you. The yeah. Holy Spirit moved me to tell you. Uh, and then they have their own idiosyncratic interpretations of Scripture that really are slanted towards empowering them. Mm -hmm. And you have to ask yourself as somebody in the pew, uh, when does my pastor have a revelation or an understanding from the Bible that doesn't empower him. Mm -hmm. wow. Does he ever does he ever have a revelation like, hey, pastor, you need to humble yourself and wash the feet of some of the people in the church like Jesus did. You know, uh, you have to be like Jesus and be and subordinate yourself to others. Or does the pastor constantly have these revelations over and over again that just build him up, build him up and empower him? And then you can see that the pastor is using the Bible. Uh, the Holy Spirit, Jesus, God, as as really kind of interchangeable masks to disguise his naked desire for control and power. Mm -hmm. And you have to look at the pattern. Look at the pattern of behavior. Uh, take your take your eye off the distraction, which could be you know biblical claims, spiritual claims, and look at the behavior of the of the leader. What does that tell you? Mm -hmm. mm. And one thing I know about masks is that when you're naked, they don't cover up that much. <laughs> well, anyway, what were you going to say? Very true. <laughs> wow. <laughs> it's actually oh 50 God. shades of gray uh -huh. uh, yeah, in yeah, the tree right there. Thank you for that, Rick. That was nice. <laughs> <laughs> uh so rick um what uh so you have a you also have a, a chapter in your book about recovery um mm. so uh, that's a word we like around here recovery mm -hmm. yeah um that's what our that's what our show's all about recovery from trauma um what advice would you give to people that are out of cults or even i i think a, there's gonna be a lot of overlap with out of fundamentalist religion um on on how to how to get better how to how to get through the trauma well, I think the, the, the key is understanding education and unraveling what happened. Mm. So you rewind your experience and then you kind of stop it and look at it and stop it and look at it. And then you compare it 
to the research about destructive authoritarian groups, some called cults, and you ask yourself, did they do that to me? And you start to unpack their tricks that they use yes, to Yes, yes, yes. And so once you understand all their bag of tricks, you know, they like what they control, they don't like what they don't control, that's one of the guiding principles. And you you start to realize, hey, I see how they manipulated me. Yes. I see how, how they, they used this to get at me and that, how they twisted this scripture and that, they tweaked this one and then that gave them leverage to use this other thing. They're, they used spiritual revelation and the Holy Spirit as a mask. You learn all their tricks, and then they can't trick you anymore. Mm-hmm. And then you start mm-hmm. to realize, uh, uh, I, I think, that they are rather predatory and that they're not very nice people. And, and one of the most important things is don't beat yourself up. Don't yeah. blame yeah. yourself. Recognize that you came to the group with idealism you came to the group thinking i just want to serve the lord i want to be uh like jesus i want to help Mm. and then i get into this group and they had this other agenda and it wasn't what i thought they were all about in fact they they misled me they were deceptive they they laid out hey we're all about god and and the kingdom of god and and helping people and then as I got in, bit by bit, step by step, I realized they were something else. Don't beat yourself up. Don't blame yourself. Don't, don't do that because that's not going to help you. Absolutely. I think, I, I think the thing to do is understand what they did, how they did it, and unpack it. That's the that's key. That's huge. And, that's huge. Very as cool. I started watching documentaries that you were in and, and other ones as well, um, Holy Hell was a big one for me. And um, Leah Rimney, of course, like, she's a <laughs> goddess. Like, I'm starting a religion <laughs> based on how much I adore her. Uh-huh. But, you know, watching that, it just seemed like, okay, they have this thing called... <laughs> it's a really they, funny thing to say, Disconnecting, Brady. when they disconnect people, you know? Um, and I'm like, that was the same, in essence, of what it was like to be disfellowshipped. Mm-hmm. And it was a different terminology. But, but what you're saying is kind of like um, this extra step of learning definitions, but it's also, okay, but now you've taught yourself this language. Now see how other people have spoken it and how that's affected them and then kind of learn from their lessons as well. Mm-hmm. So I'm able to watch stuff about Scientology and learn about mm-hmm. um all of you know those things and i can watch shows about people who have been you know disconnected and then i can relate with them and see gosh this is so much of the same thing and i can learn this extra language to help improve my knowledge and improve my Mm -hmm. recovery from it yeah that's definitely what i think one of the most helpful things is the fact that that like this kind of thing is a pattern you know whether it's whether it's a full on cult with a with an authoritarian leader or whether it's something more ambiguous like there there are these patterns of uh you know how people are treated that you can observe in all kinds of different traditions and it's re- it's it's or even relationships it's great because yeah and relationships mm-hmm. right and it's great because that gives you a more solid foundation to say like oh i was definitely mistreated mm-hmm. rather than like continuously questioning it which i think is where a lot of people get hung up um if it fits a pattern a good of abuse yeah. then it is then it's okay for you to say yes i was mistreated so the question isn't freaking out oh my god was this a cult or not you know does this fit like this exact definition right the real question is were you mistreated and what can you learn about uh, the deprogramming uh, process or learn about deconstructing or whatever. It, it's it's more healing based than it mm-hmm. is oh, a badge of honor or you know, not mm-hmm. a badge of honor. You know what I mean? Yeah, uh, no, that's no, no, yeah. dismissive. But you and, know. I, and I like what he said to you about you, uh, being nice to yourself. Some of these people have been in the mm. stuff for you know years and stuff. And then they like for me, I got out of it seven years and I thought, oh, my God, most of my friends are into their jobs, starting their families. And I've thrown away seven years of my life. Um, and so there's almost like, and the process of being nice to yourself, there's the process of grieving yes. what happened too. Yeah. And being kind to yourself in that pro- grieving process. But. Well, and if you're in a group and it sounds like Scientology and it smells like Scientology, whoa, what's mm-hmm. that mean? Mm-hmm. I mean, if you 
walks like a duck and it walks like a duck, it just might be a duck. <laughs> so you look at Jehovah's Witnesses, for example. I think they're a really good example of a destructive authoritarian group, in my opinion. Oh, yeah. And in my opinion, they started as a classic cult. I mean, Charles Taze Russell. Mm -hmm. They were called the Russellites for Christ. For crying out loud. You know? yeah, for Christ's sake. For okay. Christ's sake. You know, I mean, what, what's more cult-like than that? You're known as the Russellites. Mm -hmm. So anyway, they, they, they devolved power after one succession. There was this guy, Judge Rutherford, who ran Jehovah's Witnesses for a while. And then he died. And then they devolved into what's called the governing body, which is like a dozen old white guys that run the whole organization. Not creepy but at all. But man, are they destructive. I get mm -hmm. complaints about them all the time. I've done interventions to get people out. I've testified in custody cases in court against them. Wow. They shun people. They disfellowship yeah. them. They, they have a disconnection policy that's withering. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. and it's Bible based. I mean, mm -hmm. supposedly. Absolutely. Right, right, and right. so they Ours tell their too. parishioners, they tell them, hey, uh, you know, an elder gets up in a kingdom hall and they say they say this person's been disfellowshipped. And that may mean that their whole family will shun them, that they will have no communication with their family and that they are ostracized. Mm -hmm. They can't talk to their old friends. This this can be devastating. So damaging. To somebody who grew up in Jehovah's Witnesses. Yeah. So uh, that is one group that I, I, I get a lot, a lot of complaints about. Mm -hmm. And um and then there are other groups that have the same practices. So you have to ask yourself, what is this all about? Is it is it about uh, creating a society or an organization to help people? Or is it about just naked power and control? Mm -hmm. Because I think the shunning and the disfellowshipping is directly related to controlling information and and socially isolating people yes yes and, and to, you want to create that echo chamber effect you mm -hmm. want people in a bubble so when somebody says something like well why are we doing that or why did we do this and they begin to raise critical questions that 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 the leadership doesn't like mm -hmm. they don't want to be questioned then they say well that person should be disfellowshipped because we don't want that voice in our environment. We don't want any any feedback from someone like that. We want everything to be reinforcing our power, reinforcing our control. And the person who's disfellowship, they, they feel terrible. They've been thrown out of Jehovah's Witnesses. And they think, is that because Jehovah God doesn't love me? Is it mm -hmm. my fault? Am I, am I a broken, bad person? And what they really need to do instead is compare Jehovah's Witnesses to Scientology and other destructive authoritarian groups and, and say, gee, it's not me, it's them. Mm -hmm. And they really are very controlling and they hurt people. And what I said was reasonable and what they did to me was totally unreasonable. Mm -hmm. And I, I have to cope with my family situation and my friends that I miss and everything. But one thing I need to realize is it's not about me, it's about them. And, and the research and all of the reading that you can do uh, can confirm that and make you feel at least uh, like you're on solid ground and that you may, uh, you may have been ostracized by the group, but it's the group that really is to blame, not you. Man, that is beautiful. That is so helpful. Hmm. Uh, so that that actually leads into um, a question that that Corey had for you, uh, particularly with in terms of like being gentle with ourselves and um, in terms of like, uh, um, you know, th this th these these disfellowshipping communities and those kinds of things. Um, go ahead. Go to what would you want to ask him? Well, I wanted you to make, like demyth uh, demystify the types of people that get into cults because oftentimes it's easy to try I was I made the term of earlier of trauma shaming like who in the hell would get in a cult you know who's stupid enough to do that but the reality is like Me. if people knew it, it's so mm -hmm. common for the doctors and lawyers to get in just as it is the young people mm -hmm. so I wonder if you could speak to like the demographic that cults attract there is no specific profile I mean there's been a ton of research done about this trying to identify oh what is the profile mm -hmm. and I have deprogrammed five medical doctors and a clinical psychologist mm -hmm. and the wow. only thing I can say that they shared in common maybe 
at times you can see a thread pulling through and this would be people who were not born into the group let me qualify that first because there's this whole huge amount of people that are just simply born into a church organization or a group that is authoritarian they never chose it their parents did and so their parents were telling them hey this is it this is where you should be this is where god wants you to be and so they just accepted that and conform to that. But the people who join, who are recruited, uh, they may be going through a bad patch in life. You know, maybe they just broke up with somebody, they got divorced, there was a death in the family, there was a financial setback, uh, they were flunking courses at, at college, and, and they were having a rough time. And about that time, somebody appealing, or maybe a coworker, or a friend, or even a cousin, a family member, said, hey, how about this group? This group can help you. This group has the answers for you. I mean, come on, it can't hurt. It's like chicken soup. Come over here and go to, go to some meetings with me. We, we're gonna have a hayride. We're gonna have a volleyball game. Tom we, Cruise we got- will be there. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, right, right. Tom Cruise will be there. John Travolta will be doing Saturday Night Fever dancing or whatever. I would pay money to watch that. that. Look, it's cool. You know, you can just drop in. It won't hurt you. I mean, what people don't realize is the come on can be so smooth and it can just and it oozes into people Mm. through the cracks in their life. And, and it, it, it doesn't seem threatening. It doesn't seem crazy. That comes later. You know, yeah, first comes to. the sweet, you know, external appeal. You know, it's like a bait and switch con. Or you, you, you're, you're approached. You're told all the good stuff. You hear the good mm. stuff. And then they hit you with stuff that you can really relate to. If you have a Christian background, they talk about Jesus. They talk about the Bible. If you have a Jewish background, they talk about Moses. They talk about the Ten Commandments and really good kosher food. And you just kind of go from there. And you you don't realize what you're getting into because you're you're taking little baby steps, step after step after step, going deeper and deeper if you're a recruit. And then all of a sudden you wake up one day and you're in 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 the muck. Yeah. You're embedded in the group and and you're just there. And then you're in this echo chamber where you, every time you ask a question or you have a gnawing doubt, they tell you, well, that's just Satan attacking your mind. Yeah. Or, yeah. or that's just the, the, spirit the spirit of doubt, brother. Mm-hmm. You need to you need to re- renounce that, reject that in the name of Jesus. Mm-hmm. You know, so you find yourself stuffing your doubts, rejecting your own critical thinking, believing that whenever you have uh, a, a gut feeling, an intuitive feeling that something's wrong, that's not even you. Mm. That's a demonic attack or something. Right. And so, so they get you to go against your own mind, ultimately. Yes. And it's a process that happens over a period of time, step by step, spoonful by spoonful, and you don't really realize it's happening until you're embedded. Wow. And then it's so hard to to just say, uh, somebody tell you know, give me some feedback. And there's nobody to give you feedback because you're embedded in mm-hmm. in this kind of bubble world. That go ahead, Corey. I was gonna say I was laughing because <laughs> when I was uh, just in a vulnerable place when I was young, there were the group that I got involved with. They did art shows, and I thought I was oh how captivating! All these artist missionaries are living in Germany and. That's what, how I kind of fell in. And then over the years, w- once you're in the door, you get a two to five year commitment that you have to sign. So that's how they keep you, mm. you know, tethered. And so I tried getting out. I have email documentation. I tried getting out like five times and they always would say, well, you committed to us. So you have to at least you have to s- fulfill that. And anyway, but I was laughing be- because of the, some of the things you were saying, how accurate they were. <laughs> yeah. Well, one, one of the things that I did in the book was I wrote a whole chapter on cult brainwashing. And the book has like 1,250 plus research footnotes. And what I did was I took Robert Cialdini's Six Principles of Influence. I was just about to ask you about this. (laughs) Yeah, J. Lifton's Eight Criteria for a Thought Reform Program, and Edgar Schein of of MIT, his three basic uh, steps of coercive persuasion. And I, I... Inter- intersected all of this and and tried to show how 
whether or not the leader realizes it or not, they are using this stuff. Wow. Now, some yeah. of them actually read it and, and they go, OK, this is great. I'm going to use this on my people. And a lot of them just kind of reinvent the wheel. They, they use what works. They realize social isolation works. Uh, the coercive persuasion works and they use it. And, and they go through a kind of process of trial and error and they, they incorporate it and condense it. But I think if somebody reads that chapter called Brainwashing and you're going, wait a minute, that sounds so much like the dynamics of the church that I was in. You, there it is. I mean, what healthy church uses that? Hmm. That, that hmm. is not the way a healthy church functions. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. Uh, so can you... Uh... This might might be a little bit of a thought exercise, but uh, g give me an example of like the kind of language that they would use. For, uh, the three steps of course of persuasion: breaking breaking them down, changing them, freezing them. What right. uh, what kind of language? Like a, like a like a textbook example of what that would look like in a nutshell. Okay. How it would sound to somebody from a Bible-based group, and mm -hmm. keep in mind, this could change. It could be a Hindu group. It could be a Jewish group. Right. It could be a philosophical group, a martial arts group, a meditation group. But let's focus on a Bible-based group. And it starts out with breaking people, confession, group confession. Brother, you know, you your righteousness is like filthy rags. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, you need to like confess your sins, brother. What are your sins? I know you've got them. Let's talk about them. Right. And they start breaking down, and you're crying, and you're I'm saying, gay. I, "Okay." And I did that. God, and, and, Jesus. And, and whether you realize it or not, the leader is incorporating in his head. Oh, I got him. And these are all of his 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 sins, his vulnerabilities, his mm. weak points, which I will re remember and recall, and I will use that on him later. And by the way, in Scientology, this is called auditing. Mm. Okay. And you have a spiritual counselor, and it's called spiritual counseling. And you confess while you're hooked up to part of what could be seen as a lie detector to measure wow. your nervous reaction e so they know when to drill down on something that's really yeah. good, wow. juicy. Yeah. So the first thing is break them, you know, have them uh, just confess, break them down. And then the second thing, the changing, that occurs in, in the, the kind of Bible study and fellowship meetings that they have where other members are constantly reinforcing the idea that you need to change and become a new creature. Mm. But unlike, unlike change and become a new creature in a Christian sense, in a, in a destructive authoritarian group, it's conformed to what the leader determines you must be. Obedience, subservience, subordinate yourself to the leader's agenda, uh, work your rear end off, uh, do volunteer work, do whatever, make sacrifices, don't think about what's in your best interest. Instead, consistently act in the best interest of the group. That's the change. And then finally, the freezing is, like Corey said, I signed a contract, I'm committed, mm. and, uh, and then I'm in this bubble world where everyone is constantly reinforcing my commitment and telling me, oh, brother, you are really walking the walk. And <laughs> you're not just talking the talk, brother. You're walking the walk. <laughs> yeah, you're yeah, so yeah. good at this. And we're wow. all in this together. And then, and then they're locking it down. They're yeah. locking it down, and they've got you frozen. Hmm. And what it takes to get out is to think outside the box. And you begin to thaw your, your critical thinking, and yes. you melt have a kind of melting process mm -hmm. where, again, you start using your head, using uh, the, the brain that God gave you, mm -hmm. and you're mm -hmm. thinking for yourself, and you're thinking outside the box that the group has constructed. Mm. Very cool. Um, well, I think we're going to take a quick break, because uh, this is a good turning point. I want to ask, ask you some bigger uh, questions about... Uh, some uh, slightly bigger concepts when we get back. So, uh, stay, stay, don't hit pause.
If you were going to die tonight, do you know where you Stop. Would... Just tell them about our website. Oh, just tell them to go to the lifeafter.org? Yes, they can go now, even without accepting Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. <laughs> the lifeafter.org. We have a blog, contact page, a link to our Facebook page, and more. All right, the lifeafter.org. Heavenly. Welcome back, everybody, to The Life After. Uh, we are here with uh, Corey Pig from the Field Missionary, Rick Allen Ross from the Colt Education Institute. Um, okay, so I am a millennial. I, I kind of fell into that category, on, uh, which I'm proud of. I almost said, unfortunately, I'm proud of it. But one thing with the millennials is we are brought up thinking that television was sometimes bad or video games were bad because they didn't really compel us. But then we hit like the golden age of television and video games. And then I'm seeing like games like Far Cry 5 that legitimately educated me, right? And then there's other shows that um, like... Oh, what was that on Hulu? There was a cult show on there. Do you know what I'm talking uh, about? <laughs> that that little one that uh... that Aaron Aaron uh, Aaron Paul is on from. Oh Breaking yeah Back. yeah yeah I can't remember the name and, of it. Yeah, it Aaron also, Paul. Yeah, I, I, I'm going to give it credit. Are you, are you, Gosh, are you talking it. about Kimmy Schmidt? No, well, Kimmy that's Schmidt my too, life. and that's oh, another cult show. Yeah. God, that show changed my life. Um, but you know, we're kind of like learning about these things in really weird alternative ways. Uh -huh. Right. Um, and Rick, you're part of that. And I think that's so damn cool. How should we be learning about these things? What are other ways we can expose to it? And, um, what are the best ways that we can find these things? Well, we, you know, look, Far Cry 5 is a really good uh, portrayal of an extreme destructive cult with mm. a compound going through a meltdown. And uh, when I traveled around the world for the rollout of Far Cry 5, uh, people would say, is this really uh, solid? Is this factual? Does this really ring true? And I would say, absolutely. And yeah. they would ask me different questions like, uh, do, do cults use drugs? And I said, yeah, there is a cult that used drugs, Colonia Dignidad in Chile. Hmm. And do cults have a big compound like that in Montana? And I said, yeah, the Church Universal and Triumphant, led by Elizabeth Clare Prophet. And uh, do, do leaders uh, stockpile weapons and get crazy like that? David Koresh, uh, yeah. Aum Shinrikyo in Japan when they released poison gas on the Tokyo subway system. Mm -hmm. Good God. So I told them everything you see in Far Cry 5, it's a composite. They've taken bits and pieces from historical cults hmm. and they've created a composite cult, which is led by their prophet, Joseph Seed. And it's, you know, it's very real. So when you play the game, you're interacting with cult members, you're interacting with a cult leader, you're seeing the dynamics of a cult and it can be very educational. And then there have been a number of TV shows like uh, Kimmy Schmidt, God. in which this woman lived in a doomsday cult in a bunker. She comes out and she has to completely reconnect with reality. Hmm. And she's been traumatized. She's been abused. She's been uh, uh, completely uh, consumed yeah. by this group. And she gets out and has to reinvent herself. I think that's an interesting um, television show from the standpoint of recovery Absolutely. and how you do it and how do you reinvent your life and, and mm -hmm. reconnect with the world uh, when you've been shut away in this kind of isolated life. So I think a lot of what we see in the media is really helpful and it helps us to percolate our critical thinking and imagine uh, what it's really all about. And then there's so a wealth of uh, books uh, out there. Um, you, you mentioned Leaving the Fold by Winnell which is a great book. There's also Snapping by Flo Conway and Jim Siegelman, who also wrote a book about fundamentalism called Holy Terror back mm -hmm. in the 80s. And they talk about emotional control and the way groups manipulate people. And they talk about spiritual warfare and how groups manipulate that theme. So there's all this material out there and, and media out there that can help us. That's so cool. It's amazing. Very cool. Uh, so, Rick, you, you've cataloged, would you say hundreds or, or, or over, have you cataloged over a thousand different cults? Oh, yeah. There are thousands and thousands. Okay. I learn about a new cult almost every day. 
my phone rings, wow. somebody starts talking about some guru or okay. leader, and I've never heard of the person. Yeah. And, and by the way, there are now cults that are completely functioning on online. Life. Yeah. That's so people don't up. even meet physically. Mm. They interact yeah. through Skype. They, they give money through PayPal. Wow. They Google gaggle. They, Probably they Bitcoin. <laughs> Yeah, they, which I mean, is a good. If I could pause you just for a second, this is a great time to let our listeners know that uh, we have a secret Facebook group. If you'd like to join, uh, <laughs> on to, it's true. And we only accept untraceable <laughs> Bitcoin donations. <laughs> but you know, it's funny you say it because uh, earlier when you, when I asked Corey about, hey, what uh, what is kind of like the theme going on with your cult leader earlier, and then you within the first five seconds said something about his SEO abilities. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like yeah, his yeah, ability yeah. to use online marketing. Right. And yeah, it's it looks so much different. And we joked about the Borg earlier, but really like digital media and everything is kind of a way that uh, we do have so much more extreme influence that it's not saying, oh, anybody who uses this is bad, but recognizing that this is kind of a unique media tool that uh, previous generations aren't necessarily going to be equipped to educate us on right because the, the, the experience wasn't there to have such a fast media pace fast-paced media um so uh if you had to if yeah let's see how, how better should i smart. i just used fast-paced media that was good so no you, you, you nailed better it. have a really you smart nailed it with fast-paced question. media <laughs> um I, I was gonna ask is the, is there one particular or a couple of di- particular groups that stand out to you that are up and coming that you think are particularly dangerous well, there's a, a a woman online. Her name is Teal Swan. Okay. And she has a really big following. And she has said that suicide is a way of rebooting your life. Oh, no. Wow. No, that's, no, no, that's no, very, no. That's a very disturbing mm-hmm. uh, statement. And uh, she's got a huge following online. She's got her own YouTube channel, which people are constantly involved in. Uh, that group uh, and that following concern me. There's also a, a black supremacist group called Israelites United in Christ, which is led by Nathaniel Ray, okay. which is a very disturbing group that's growing across the entire United States. Ray setting up camps. People are learning uh, and being indoctrinated in their homes through YouTube. And they're following him on Twitter and social media, on Instagram. And this is becoming the the increasingly used tools, uh, you know, that cult leaders use to gain a following. And then there's another group called World Mission Society Church of God that's kind of a classic. It's led by a woman in Seoul, South Korea, who claims that uh, God is female and that she's God. Mm. And they mother God. And they started in Ridgewood, New Jersey. They've spread all across the United States and Canada. And man, they are just growing rapidly. They recruit at Costco in malls. Wow. They go to college campuses. I mean, they're really out there. So there are a number of new groups. Then there's the old groups that we all know about that have been called cults like Scientology, the Unification Church of Reverend Moon, mm-hmm. and uh, you know the Hare Krishna International Society of Krishna Consciousness, and so on and so on. And I, I mean to say this again. Jehovah's Witnesses, man, I get a lot of complaints about those uh, the the witnesses, and and let me just say that people die every year that are witnesses because of their policy regarding yeah, blood, blood transfusions, transfusions. Right. Yeah. especially mm. women giving birth to children. God. And people, uh, you know, they they basically die for the Watchtower Bible and <clears throat> Tract Society, mm. which is the official name of Jehovah's Witnesses. And the elders in a particular kingdom hall will go to the hospital and encourage a parent to let their child die rather than receive a blood transfusion. And the courts have had to intercede Mm. to protect children. I know they've been covering that on uh, Leah Remini's show this season, you know, that they're they're yeah. doing one on Jehovah's Witnesses. And I was really happy to see that. I, I know there's an Instagram following, too, that I follow through the life after and my own personal accounts that talk a lot about Jehovah's Witnesses and, and what goes on back there in the behind the scenes. And it is terrifying as hell. Absolutely mm-hmm. terrifying. Yeah. By, by the way, Mike Rinder, he used to basically denounce people like me. And now I watch him like you and I say, hey, this guy is really something. 
because he has gone through so much pain. This guy left Scientology. He was uh, near the top. Yeah. You know, he was the official spokesperson for Scientology. And when he left, he lost his family. Yeah. Mm. I mean, they all turned on him, according to Scientology, and rejected him. And this guy is soldiered on. He and, and Leah Remini have, have really done a, a lot to help people. Mm. And, and there are a lot of Scientologists or ex-Scientologists who watch that show and it's very healing for them. Mm -hmm. And what Remini is doing is basically what I've talked about, which is she's saying, hey, let's rewind this. Let's look at all of what's happened to people, mm -hmm. how it happened, what they did. And then this is, can be very freeing because mm -hmm. we realize how we were scammed mm -hmm. and how, how we were taken advantage of. And, and when you can get your head around that, then there, the fear goes away. Because you know, hey, they can't get me again because I know all their all their moves. I know their tricks. Hmm. And so they're not going to get me again. And I don't need to feel guilty and feel ashamed because they were predatory and they were uh, they were slick and they were running their their scheme on me. And I didn't know it. And uh, so I think people like Leah Remini and, and Mike Rinder, who really know what that world is all about, yeah. when they come out and they just lay it out the way they do, that's, I just think that's great. God, I love her. So and she's so beautiful, Chuck. She's quite beautiful. <sighs> yeah. Definitely had a crush on her when she was married to Doug Heffernan, of all people. I mean, just, you know, <laughs> uh, Rick, what's his name? The, Dave, James, something James. James, I don't know. King of the King, King of Queens. King of Queens, about? yeah. I don't know. I'm I was gay, like, I and think, I think she's, I think the most she's a little. Person I think alive, she's so. a little out of his league. Uh, yeah, totally. Um, so, Rick. Uh, so, I think the first thing that a lot of people think of when they think of a cult is uh, is usually religious, the religious or spiritual aspect. In a lot of cases, that's not necessarily the focus. It's sort of a tool that's used to further the other agenda. So you mentioned this, uh, this like exclusively black play, or black play, I almost said plague. This almost <laughs> exclusively uh, black cult, plague cult. I mean, there's some overlap. Um, oh God. So you've, you've, I've heard you call Nazism uh, the, uh, the biggest, most destructive cult. Um, and we're seeing this sort of resurgence of it. We have up and coming leaders like Richard Spencer. We have Charlottesville protests. Uh, we have, I mean, we have a president that won't directly renounce the white supremacy. Uh, there's a, and, and it's, 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 again, sort of takes place on the internet more than anywhere else. Or it seems to and sites like 4chan, um, and foxnews.com. Yeah. What uh, What do you think about... So when this, this movement is so widespread, it's physically hard to trace. It is... Uh, it's it's growing in these really strange ways. What, what, what do you think is the best way to approach slowing its expansion? Even from... Mm -hmm. I mean, we're talking hypothetical. So if I was like, you know, uh, a governor of a state or something, you know, and I had some kind of authority, like what, what do you think needs to be done? Well, I think uh, we need to educate kids in school about mm -hmm. coercive persuasion, about thought reform, about how that works. We don't need to tell them, oh, this group is a cult or that group is a cult, but we need to develop critical thinking mm -hmm. and analysis so that when somebody is trying to run any kind of scam on you, 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 you can see the red flags. And then I think uh, social media, uh, Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, they, they have a responsibility. Mm -hmm. They need to understand that, that nobody's saying that they're evil, mm -hmm. but that they are a sword that can cut both ways mm -hmm. uh, for good or for bad. And, and they need to uh, do, police uh, their content to a certain extent regarding mm -hmm. hate groups and so forth. Uh, and I think they're starting to do that and they're, they're becoming more cognizant of how groups are using their platform to recruit and influence people. And what we're seeing is uh, we're seeing people being radicalized through mm -hmm. social media, mm -hmm. through youth, whether it's by Nathaniel Ray through Israelites United in Christ or it's the New Zealand shooter you know, who had, who, who really was active in social media yeah. and online. 
and and we're seeing people recruited by ISIS online. I mean, mm. that's historically evident. So what we need to do is recognize that, and we need to counteract it. We need to have programs in schools to to educate kids. And and when mm. someone is just using YouTube as a platform to spew hate and recruit people, like some of these groups are, maybe they need to pull the plug. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a great answer. And uh, uh, you, uh, Facebook did just recently, a couple of days ago, put a place a ban on white nationalism. Um, and that actually, if you attempt to post something that they identify as white nationalist in nature, they'll redirect you to a site that helps people uh, out of wh- uh, like white supremacy or white supremacist groups, which is which is pretty interesting. It's a good change in policy. Did they direct you to that page when you refer to them as the Black Plague? <laughs> wow. now hopefully not because we have to we're subject to the itunes uh terms and policy or whatever That's right. yeah i'm recusing myself <laughs> of course you would uh so rick we have this uh we, we're living in a very interesting time in history you probably get this question a lot um uh huge political shift happened in 2016 uh do you feel that donald trump i mean there, there he obviously has a cult like following right he has this his core is very dedicated to the idea that he is never wrong or uh, that he is the the one answer and the one savior do you feel that donald trump himself exhibits characteristics of a cult leader well he he does come across as kind of an autocrat and an authoritarian kind of guy i mean it it seems like the one word that really upsets him is no uh-huh you know? I I won't do whatever. But we have to recognize he's not like a cult leader. He was elected through a democratic process and the Electoral College of the United States. So he's constitutionally uh, elected president. Yeah. And um, a lot of people who didn't vote, a lot of people who maybe uh, voted for a third party candidate in certain key states, maybe they need to sit back and reexamine what they did. Uh, But he is the president. And he is subject to, you know, being voted out in 2020. Uh, the, a, lot of, <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of the people that follow him do seem to be very uh, single-minded in their support of him. Uh, they do seem to spin everything in, in, in almost kind of like cognitive dissonance. You know, mm-hmm. like if facts contradict what I believe, I'll spin it so that I can reconcile that conflict. Right. And a lot of people that support Trump seem to do that. But then there are people that supported Bernie Sanders that do that as well. Absolutely. Yeah. So so there are people on the left that are very, you know, black and white, no shades of gray. And there are people on the right that are that way as well. And and I think what we have to do is just recognize that um, everything isn't black and white and that there is ambiguity Mm -hmm. and that part of getting out of that cult mindset is having a, a higher tolerance for ambiguity right. and really talking to each other. Mm. One of the things I think is the most disturbing about this era of Trump is people being isolated and not really having a conversation. Absolutely. And, and saying, look, you know, I don't agree with uh, Donald Trump, but I want to talk to you. Or people saying, look, I really like Donald Trump and I want to talk to you and understand where you're coming from. Right. Mm. I, I don't hear enough of that lately. And th- that polarization is very cult-like in and of mm. itself. Mm-hmm. And it's disturbing. Mm. It is. Yeah, it's very disturbing. And it's and it's becoming more and more widespread. Uh, I think that, I, I think one of the worst things about millennial culture is shame culture, where we have this like idea that if you say or do the wrong thing once, like you're out, right? So right, right. it's really difficult for people, even if they're reasonable, ethical people, to come out and sit and criticize uh, a liberal movement on Twitter, or to, or if you're a conservative, to come out and criticize a conservative movement, a conservative movement, and it's just this sort of automatic knee-jerk reaction to say like, oh no, you're out, you are not, because you're not fitting the black and white thinking. I mean, that's like. That's like this, it's like a giant cult. It's like a massive, you know, uh, cultural movement of a cult, you know. It's very difficult. (laughs) We got puns. We got puns. Mm. Still got it. 
so okay so a, a lot of these cult groups are are sort of founded on a, a religion that already exists that tends to be how these things start so a cult leader um grabs hold of a belief system manipulates mm. it to fit their personal needs and then sort of runs with it uh so you have like i mean you have the bible you have the quran you have you know all, all kinds of historical religious documents that are really really old um and it just seems to me like they're it's really easy to exploit these documents like it's really easy to cherry pick it's really easy to uh, to manipulate them to sort of do what you want them to do. Whereas like more modern documents, like, you know, you couldn't start a cult based on the constitution of the United States or based on your book or, you know what I mean? Like we have these more concrete, uh, documents now that don't seem to be easy to exploit for your own desires right so well, they're not magic either we don't think they're magic right they're also not mad maybe that's the maybe that's the element i was i was just going to ask what do you think it is about old religious documents that just makes them so Ooh. easy to exploit in that way well i you know i come at it from a different perspective i i really think there's a lot of good in for example the bible mm -hmm. but, uh, you can twist it and the people that are running destructive groups, whether it's a, a full-blown cult or it's just a destructive authoritarian group that's exploiting people, uh, what they're what they're uh, adept at is uh, honing in on what people want to hear, what they what they what they crave. Like, for example, uh, clarity. Mm -hmm. uh, and absolutism can be very appealing. A mm -hmm. sense of, of, of direction and purpose can be very appealing. And what these people do is they just grab on to what has popular culture currency. I mean, if, if I come to you in the name of Jesus Christ, uh, you're probably, if you live in the U.S., more likely to listen to me than I if I come to you in the name of Mahatma Gandhi. Right. Mm -hmm. you know, so so whatever has social currency, whatever's popular, and what I see these leaders doing over and over again is just grabbing different themes from popular culture, whether it's uh, space aliens or the Bible or psychic power or whatever. But what what I want to focus on is not what the group believes but how the group behaves. Mm. So strip away the beliefs and get down to the behavior of the group. Does the group hurt people? Because if there's a group and they believe that aliens from outer space uh, uh, died on Earth and their souls are floating around and attaching to our bodies, which is kind of a Scientology belief mm -hmm. uh, for the explanation of the human condition, I think it's okay as long as they're not hurting people. Mm -hmm. Why should I care? But if they use their beliefs and in the name of their beliefs, they hurt people and exploit people, then it becomes an issue. Mm. So I'm not so much concerned about which books they use or whether they're old religious books or new religious books or whatever. The bottom line for me is how are they affecting the people that they're influencing? Mm. Are they hurting them or are they helping them? What are they doing? And if they're hurting them, I'm probably going to get a phone call or an right. email or something and and somebody's going to bring it the group to my attention otherwise who 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 cares mm. i mean let people believe whatever they want sure. that's my yeah. attitude mm -hmm. i love thinking of you getting these phone calls just like a red <laughs> bat phone and they're like <laughs> we got another one and you're just like they like flip on the, the Rick signal. Yeah. And he's like, it'll be deprogrammed. And then he hangs up like <laughs> Olivia Pope. We also, we were, we were joking before we got on with you that we were watching some old clips of you, like in, in your 48 hours and all of this. And there's a lot of you like walking into places with a briefcase and these really badass looking sunglasses. Yes. And, and yeah. we want that to be a TV show like CBS, the deprogrammer. You go in there and you like fuck shit up for Jonathan Seed and David <laughs> Crush and all them. Right. I would watch it. I would watch it religiously. Uh -huh. I think I'd have there a cult is. following. Uh, ooh, oh. We're on a roll now. Well, from from your lips to the development team's ears. <laughs> there you go. There you go. We'll make sure that we'll make sure it's we'll get a foot in the door for you. Very cool. 
Um, so uh, this is my personal last question, but uh, you can help me. You can help me out, Rick, with a with a uh, a project that I'm kind of working on. So, uh, and I think I, I've I've heard you answer similar questions before. So I'm, I'm I'm but I'm interested in this specific approach. So um, see it. So okay, well, a lot of what I deal with personally is like sort of coming up with um workable rebuttal for christian apologist approaches to things and that's you know that's that's not your, really your wheelhouse because you're not trying to take down christianity like me <laughs> what? i'm just kidding um sort of um but one of the big one of the big sort of questions that that comes up a lot is is cs lewis famously argues in mere christianity that jesus was either a lunatic or uh or the son of god right and that's sort of mm-hmm. he creates this false dichotomy um in order to sort of like manipulate the the conversation black a little and white bit thinking, right. yeah it's black and white thinking uh which you know it's just it's just a logical fallacy i don't think cs lewis was a terrible person or anything um, but my rebuttal to that is, is always like, I don't think he was either. I think he was more or less a cult leader, not necessarily. I mean, he's not, he wasn't exploiting people for money. It doesn't seem like he Charismatic was. Charismatic leader. The historical Jesus that we get from the New Testament was not necessarily an inherently destructive person, but he, you know, he came bringing not peace, but a sword, dividing yeah, okay. families. He... Uh, you know, he's his disciples. He just sort of like swipes up from his family, which at the time culturally kept was giving a people bit alcohol. Normal. I mean, some he of kept... them could have. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I was Southern Baptist, Rick. So it's a uh, you know, right, right, right. We like alcohol um, and dancing jokes. So, so would you draw if if you had to say in what ways was Jesus a cult leader and which ways was he not? How would you parse that out? Ooh, okay. Okay. I would say first of all that historical Jesus is really hard to 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 dig down and drill into mm-hmm. because there's so little history that it, that other than the new testament accounts but based on the new testament accounts uh you could see the group uh that gathered around jesus as being a personality driven uh kind of cult following i mean because they were very caught up in him and and his claims and his beliefs and and what he wanted to do his sense of mission and that became their purpose, their life, and they subordinated themselves to him. But where he comes sharply in contrast with the cult leaders that I have dealt with is ultimately he dies for them. They uh-huh. don't die for him. Right. And he's broke. He doesn't have anything. The donkey he rides into Jerusalem is borrowed. Yeah. I mean, the guy is just, he has nothing and he doesn't care about money. That's not like any cult leaders that I know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then, and then when uh, he, when he's, when even when he's, uh, you know, when he doesn't want to judge people, mm-hmm. you know, the cult leaders I know are relentlessly judgmental. Right. And Jesus is saying, well, you know, like, judge not lest ye be judged, and don't throw the stone. You know, let. Mm. let person who is without sin cast the first stone Mm -hmm. and the cult leaders i know are saying where are the rocks let's start even them right you know so so basically he is a much more uh benign figure and then ultimately um he he dies sacrificially for ever for his followers for the world rather than having others suffer for him. Mm-hmm. So I think that's kind of a, a, a complete reversal of, of a lot of what I have seen with the cult leaders. The question that I always ask people is, I know your group makes a lot of supernatural claims, okay? Magical claims, claims about special power, special insight, etc. You know, the Holy Spirit is revealed to you. Uh, prophecies have come through you, you have all of this. Well, uh, when a, a person makes a supernatural claim that cannot be proven, you have to ask yourself this as a person who's hearing that claim. Does the claim uh, make demands on me? Mm-hmm. So, for example, if somebody says to me, I believe in Santa Claus. Santa Claus is up there on the North Pole. He's got the elves. They're working away. And he's going to come down your chimney or at least throw you a gift through, you know, your doggy door and Christmas. Mm. 
it's supernatural. If, if somebody wants to believe that, but it makes no demand on me, it's okay. Let them believe in Santa or the Tooth Fairy. But when they say to me, look, Santa's up there. He needs a cashier's check for 10 grand. <laughs> he, needs it, right. he needs it tomorrow morning. The, el- the elves of you. Uh, I've got an address. <laughs> You've got to make th- that cashier's check and it's got to make the drop. Then we're into another world. Right. Then we then we're in. We've stepped into. Okay, you're not just making a supernatural claim. You're making a demand based on a supernatural claim that cannot be proven. And before I make make the ten thousand dollar cashier's check payable to Santa Inc. or whatever LLC you've concocted right. for him, I I want you to prove that he exists, uh-huh. and I want you to prove your claim. So that's what I'm saying to people uh, that are in groups that they tell me, well, the group leader says A, B, C, and because of these supernatural imperatives and claims, I'm going to submit and obey the leader. Really? Has he proved that to you? Mm -hmm. You know, because he's, he's making demands on your life, and before you submit, you better ask him to prove it. You know, prove yeah. that he is the conduit by which God is revealing truth to the whole world. I mean, really? Because I can see how the supernatural claims empower him and, and give him control over you. Uh, but it, are you willing to submit and surrender control to this leader without him actually proving those supernatural claims? Yes. I think you should make demands on this leader. Hmm. Make him prove it. Mm-hmm. Damn, that was good. That was good. Don't, don't you think, though, that there's something to be said about Jesus' demand for unyielding loyalty by, by his apostles? I mean, I mean you, we have, like, martyrdom. We have, you know, these people sacrificed everything, and they, I think they felt that they needed to because of the teachings of Jesus. What do you think about that? Well, I think the rich young ruler in the New Testament is kind of the, the, the piece for me. Okay. I mean, Jesus... You know, he's very caught up in Jesus and he wants to follow Jesus and and Jesus is just, you know, follow the commandments and be a good person. And that's that's all right. You know, and then he says, no, no, I want more than that. I want more than that. And so then Jesus says, "Okay, well, then sell everything you have and give it to the poor and come and follow me. And the rich young ruler says, "Eh, I don't think so. Mm-hmm. So then Jesus doesn't say, oh, you're a lousy piece of garbage sure. and you're going to burn in hell for eternity. He says, whatever. And he keeps going. You've received a so reward in I, full, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I don't see Jesus as being um, as harsh and punitive as as the cult leaders that I deal with. Okay. Hmm. Very cool. That That's really helpful. Thank you so much. Did you guys have anything else? No, I'm just blown away. That was such a great uh, conversation. This is, Rick, I, yeah, yeah, this yeah. is really good. I cannot good. thank you enough for um, agreeing to be on our show and uh, helping to make Far Cry 5. <laughs> <laughs> Brady, that's awesome. That's, well, that's what will be on my tombstone is uh, <laughs> Rick Allen Ross, deprogrammer and advisor on Far Cry 5. <laughs> yes. Well, and your upcoming CBS show that I'm going to help write. Uh, yeah, yeah, that'll yeah. be that'll be out soon. By, uh, by the way, I, I'm, I'm, in, I, I'm in an upcoming Dr. Phil, my fourth. Okay, Dr. very cool. Is in the can and it's going to be on soon and you'll know it it's uh, Jonestown. Oh, oh okay. cool. Uh, and you remember Congresswoman Jackie Spear. Yes. Who was with Leo J Ryan at Jonestown and when she was shot five it. times. She yes. wrote a book. Dr. Phil interviews her and I'm the cult expert that he brought on in the first very cool. always the expert sit in the first row. Uh-huh. So I look at you. I'm not on the stage. Oh, I know what I you're get... talking about where they cut to you. Yeah, yeah. I remember watching out an yeah. Oprah and stuff when I was a kid. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That, so that's gonna be on when you see the next Dr. Phil that says Jonestown and and Congresswoman Jackie Spear, I'll be on that. It was a great show. It's gonna, it's gonna really be good. Awesome. I think he's holding it for sweeps or something like that because oh. it's, it's a really powerful show. Cool. Ooh, that is very exciting. cool. Uh, Rick Allen Ross, uh, author of Cults Inside Out, very informative, uh, five hundred plus page book on cults. If you're, if you're interested, um, and uh, founder and dire- executive director of the Cult Education Institute. What's the website for that? 
cultteducation.com cultteducation.com and your all's YouTube page is well done you guys right. do a wonderful job posting your videos and interviews and you everything's been really good I can good say it's, it's very concise clear informative um, definitely worth checking out Rick mm. is there anything else we need to know about uh, no I think that's uh, that's good um, you know and I you know, I'm, I'm available if anyone needs help and they can oh, get yeah. in touch with me easily through the, the website culteducation.com. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Rick, Rick does do, uh, he will travel and, uh, and, and help deprogram if you know somebody that is, uh, that needs really serious help and is well, in a cult. Yeah, we make it sound like he just like gets a phone call. like, oh, let me go to Nebraska and help. Well, I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it's not like that straightforward, but I have, I have worked in every state in the United States yeah. except Wyoming. All right. And, Wyoming. Um, so I've been to Nebraska. In fact, I did an intervention in North Platte, Nebraska. All right. And then I did another intervention in Omaha. Okay. So Ooh. I've worked in Nebraska and I've also worked <laughs> all over Europe and Asia, yeah. Yeah, Australia, yeah. you know, it's it, Israel. So I've I've really Very been cool. all over the place. I think we have listeners in everywhere but Wyoming. <laughs> <laughs> but Wyoming, if you're out there, we gotta Dick we gotta Cheney. complete we gotta get him his last yeah. state quarter. <laughs> Dick, Cheney, Dick Cheney might be a fan listening in Wyoming. Yeah, there you oh, Lord. <laughs> Dick Cheney, if you're listening, ah. fuck all the way off. Okay, wow. <laughs> <laughs>